And in simplest terms, a derivative basically measures the rate of change of one variable with respect to another. The example that's often given is how position, um, let's say of a particle, uh, relates to position over time. So the derivative is how does that position of that particle change over time? And if it's moving through space, then the derivative is actually going to be the position over time, which gives us velocity, right? So in an image, what we're looking at is local changes in brightness values. So the derivative dx and dy are going to measure how fast the brightness values change along the x and y axes of the image. So we're going to look at our example again. In this case, we're going to be looping through all of our pixels. But uh, for these particular examples, we're just going to pretend as if we're looking at just a single pixel. So here is our current pixel, i, j. And if we want to find the dx, the derivative um, along the x-axis, um, what we're going to do is take the pixel to the right of it and subtract from it the pixel on the left. And we're talking about brightness values right now, not color. So in this case, uh, the derivative of uh, the derivative in the x-axis at this current position is the brightness value of the right pixel minus the one on the left. So let's look at a more concrete example. If our current pixel is this one, and the one to the the pixel on the right has a brightness value of one, and the brightness on the left is zero, then it's simply a differential where the dx is going to give us a value of one. So in this example, there's uh, a clear change happening right here because the pixel to the right is very bright and the one on the left is very dark. So we can we can actually understand that there's a change happening in the image. Whereas if these two are the same, right, we're going to take the value here and subtract it from here, it's basically 0 minus 0. So our, we recognize that there's no change happening in the image. And the same would be true if uh, these had the exact same values. It could be 0, they could be 0.5, they could be 1. Uh, but the derivative is always going to be zero because there's no change happening in the image. Um, if we go the other side, um, we're actually going to get a negative value, zero minus one. Um, but again, uh, these values are going to uh, be symmetric from negative one to positive one. Uh, and it's going to tell us uh, something about how quickly the brightness value is changing uh, uh, in relation to the current pixel. So if we were to look at an image, the dx is actually going to reveal the vertical edges in an image. So if we take an example, um, let's say this edge right here, um, what's happening here is if we look at that current pixel, we're taking a dark pixel on the right and subtracting the one on the left. So we're taking 0 minus 1 and reassigning it to that current value. Um, and so the derivative, if we were to actually make an image out of that, um, it would be negative 1, and in this case, I've actually clamped it so that the values are not negative 1. We're taking the absolute value. So any of the values that are either positive 1 or negative 1 are always going to be positive. So we're going to actually indicate uh, vertical edges in the image by looking at the derivative along the x-axis. We can do the same thing looking at the calc to calculate the derivative along the y-axis. Only this time, we're going to take the pixel on the top and subtract the pixel on the bottom. So if we, again, look at this example, we're going to take, uh, we're measuring how quickly something is changing. So 1 minus 0 is going to give us a derivative of 1. If they're the same, uh, again, it doesn't matter if it's 0 or 0.5, but as long as these two pixels are the same, then our derivative is going to be 0. And again, if we have some great change where it's going from dark to white, our value is going to be negative 1. And you have a choice to choose whether or not you want to clamp that at 0 or you want to actually take the absolute value. But if we look at the dy, what that's going to begin to tell us is more about the horizontal edges. So we can look at the two different um, derivatives independently, where if we look at the dx, we're going to look at the vertical edges, and the dy is going to give us the horizontal edges. And we can combine them together um, and find all of the edges. Right. So if we combine those two images together, we can actually begin to uh, determine both horizontal and vertical edges in an image. So that's sort of edge detection. We can also then, some, some things that are, are often common when looking at edges is you'll notice that there's actually some noise happening in the image. Um, and so we're actually getting false edges happening because of the changes in the pixel image because there's just subtle changes 
um, and the quality of the image, let's say. Um, so if you want to actually remove those, one of the techniques that's often used is to blur the image slightly before feeding it into the edge detection algorithm. And so there are different techniques you can do. One is called a box blur. And so to do that, all we're going to do is take the current pixel and average all of the adjacent pixels. So we're going to take the current pixel and add together all four of the neighbor pixels and then divide by four. And when we and then reassign that to the current pixel. So P I comma J is just going to be the average of all of its neighbors. And so what we can see here is that by doing this technique over and over again, we actually begin to blur the image. It's taking the average of the image and reassigning it. And if we do this over and over again, um, you'll begin to blur, but you'll also start to notice some artifacts of the box blur. Here we're actually seeing, um, because we're taking those adjacent images, that circular objects actually begin to fan out in a more diamond or box shape. Um, but when we apply the edge detection, you see a lot of those false edges that we were seeing in the image uh, disappear because now a lot of the changes, the very small, minute changes, have been removed from the image. So we, can, we talked about a box blur. We can also think about uh, other types of uh, blurring techniques. One is called a Gaussian blur. Um, and all this is is where each pixel is actually replaced by the weighted value average of all of its neighbors. And so we weight all of the pixels slightly differently. The center pixel is given a weight of 4. For example, all of the uh, immediately adjacent pixels are uh, given a weight of 2. And all of the corner pixels are actually weighted by 1. And all we're doing here is just adding all of those up and dividing by the sum of all of those weights. In this case, 16. So if we do that, we can actually get other types of averaging or blurring techniques. In this case, this is the image that we get after a Gaussian blur. Um, so again, other types of techniques to do box blurring or Gaussian blurring. Now, I want to introduce the topic of a convolution kernel. And all we're talking about with a convolution kernel is a small matrix, essentially a number of cells. Um, it could be a 3x3 three three matrix, a 5x5 five five matrix. We're going to start with the simplest of a 3x3 three three matrix. Um, and what we're talking about here is that a convolution kernel is, starts with an anchor point and then begins to move over an image and begins to add uh, or subtract or multiply basically a weight of all of its neighbors. So here is a, you can imagine this is our anchor point. And this box, this matrix, is actually moving along the image. It's looping through every pixel in the image. And then we can assign different values to any of its neighbor pixels. Um, and so if we didn't do anything, if we wanted the image to remain the exact same, then we would just give the anchor value a weight of 1 and all other values a 0, right? So we haven't done anything to the image if the center pixel remains 1 and everything else is a 0 as we loop through because what we're doing essentially is weighting its neighbor pixels and then reassigning it to that center pixel. And so a weight of 1 on the center pixel hasn't really done anything to the image. However, we can get that exact same box blur algorithm if we just feed this convolution kernel a matrix value that says 1, 1, 1, 1 at each of the adjacent uh, corners and then divide the result by 4, right? That's the exact same idea that we were just talking about, but this time we're using a kernel, which is a simple matrix, which is going to loop over this image and perform some operation and reassign it back to the anchor position. So in this case, we're waiting, we're taking the, the full value, because it's a weight of 1, uh, and adding them together and then dividing by 4. Um, we can do that same Gaussian blur by providing a matrix where it's 1, 2, 1, 2, 4, 2, 1, 2, 1. And so again, we have the adjacent, immediately adjacent pixels are weighted by 2, the center pixel is weighted by 4, and the corner pixels are weighted by 1. So we're changing these weighted values to get a different effect. But what's interesting about this technique is you can begin to create your own custom filters. Um, by, doing, by changing any of these numbers, we can get really drastic effects. So you don't have to actually rely on any of the tool makers to make your own custom filter. You can make your own custom filters. Um, another interesting uh, 
effect that you can do with this is the sharpening. We talked about blurring, but what if you wanted to sharpen an image? Well, in this case, what we're actually going to do is actually subtract. We're going to give a negative weight, um, in this case, of one of all of the neighbor pixels, and then actually a center pixel is going to get a weight of five. And then we're going to divide the result by one. So if you use a 3x3 three three matrix with this uh, pattern, you'll actually get a sharpening filter happening on the image. Similarly, if we wanted to look at the edge detection filter, looking at the derivatives that we were just talking about, if we, have, if we weight the uh, neighbor pixels with a positive one and a negative one, same thing with the top and bottom, we can actually begin to isolate whether we want horizontal edges, vertical edges, or both. Um, and so using a technique like this with a convolution kernel, we could either write our own um, algorithm with the derivatives like I just showed you by looping through all of the pixels, or we can define a convolution kernel to do that for us. Um, there are other techniques where we can actually begin to create embossing effects. So one of the nice things about convolution kernels is its simplicity. So here we're actually weighting the corner pixels with a positive one and the lower corners as a negative one. But then we're actually offsetting that center value, which was n normally between 0 and 255. Uh, we can create an offset value. Um, in this case, we're skewing it to be 128 to get that uh, sort of medium gray effect as the neutral color. Um, and when we do that, we get this sort of embossing effect um, of a filter. So now what we're going to do is take a look at a few examples of doing this both within Photoshop as well as in Grasshopper and Firefly.